Good morning, it is Sunday, June 4th, 2023, and I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning with hearts overflowing with thanksgiving to know the privilege and to understand the price that was paid that we might know you, have fellowship with you, and to have the assurance of your great salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you and we pray now, Heavenly Father, that you would reveal yourself in greater depth to each one of us. As your children, as members of the church, the body of Christ, I pray that your spirit will increase our hunger, our desire to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to grow in our devotion and commitment to your will and purpose for our lives. And we realize, Heavenly Father, that we have no power within ourselves to do these things, that only you can do it. And so I pray for each person here, for each person that will hear this message, and for every member of the body of Christ, that we would all be strengthened in our inner being, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth throughout all the days of our lives. And we thank you for it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's open by reading Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 17. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And so, as I mentioned before, it's my uh, desire to do a series of messages concerning the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, the one true God of Scripture. And so I covet your prayers in this endeavor because it's way beyond my scope and ability and knowledge. And so pray that the Lord will direct my studies and my uh, understanding so that I might um, do these things accurately. But to begin with, let's look at some of the words that are very prominent uh, in today. Uh, atheist. What is that? What is an atheist? Somebody that doesn't believe that God exists. The answers are on your paper, so if you want to use your cheat sheet to help answer the questions. <laughs> But an atheist believes, in fact, you notice this is theist right here. An atheist is just an addition to it that negates it. And so it means no theism, no God. They believe there is no God whatsoever. An agnostic. No knowledge. No knowledge. They just don't know. They're not totally saying there is no God. But there is no scientific proof. They're very focused in uh, science and uh, things that we can experience. And from all of that in life, they don't find a God. So they just don't know. I was talking to a man the other day, and he's very sincere. And I was sharing with him he knows my faith and that type of thing. And, and so I was asking him about his. And he says, you know, I just don't know. He says, as far as I, in my position right now, when you die, the lights go off. 
and that's it. It's over. And he, he's not antagonistic at all. He's not argumentative at all. He, he would like to know. He'd like to have an answer. People that don't know usually aren't content not knowing. So he would like to know, and he's sincere in what he believes, and I appreciate that a lot more than uh, professed believers that really think they know, and they really don't. Like when Paul was on Mars Hill, I don't know how many of you are probably, you're all familiar with it, maybe he saw all these little icons to all the different gods they worshipped, and they were theists. They believed in God or several gods, small g's. They had all kinds of icons for all their gods, and they had one icon or statue or whatever to the unknown god. They, they wanted to cover all their bases, so if there was some other god they forgot, they didn't want to offend him. And so they even had a statue to the unknown god. And Paul says, I've come here to declare to you that God. And that's the saddest thing in all this religious terminology we hear and everything is they may be very religious, they use the term Christian, they use the Bible, but they really don't know God. Anyway, back here, that's the the atheist doesn't believe in God, the agnostic doesn't really know what he believes and he admits it, I just, he wants something to prove it to him. The theist believes in gods or many gods, and so we would be theists in a sense. Now I want, again, we're talking about world history here, and our history now in the United States Remember Barack Obama and got, Barack Obama came under quite a bit of criticism because he said the United States is not a Christian country. He was right. There are no Christian countries. There just aren't. Now, that, so we sort of say, yeah, but we were founded on Christian principles. Well, then we got to get into terminology and things because I, I don't mean to shock anybody, but from my research, most of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were not Bible-believing members of the church, the body of Christ. They weren't even necessarily Bible believers as the way we would use that term. What they did believe is that there was a God and the Bible gives us information about that God, and the Bible gives us a lot of good instructions. It will make us, if we follow the Bible, it will make our nation the best nation in the world because it has all of these good instructions for us. So we'll have a, a moral people, an ethical people, and that was the same basic concept as I understand it, that Constantine did when he made what they called Christianity at the time the religion of the realm because the Christians or those people that were living according to the Bible and the revelation they had they were very much committed to living moral upright lives they weren't out there killing each other and living really lascivious lives or anything like that. And so they adopted the Bible and Christianity as sort of their religion of the realm at that time. And then there are deists which believe in a God but that he created and then pretty much turned it over to man and left it up to him to do his thing. And now those are very general descriptions, but as far as I'm concerned, we can actually do this with all of this. And just say, what does the Bible teach? And so today the Bible talks about this term. And it's not a very popular term. If you hear the word saint today, it has a very much a religious connotation that's been extracted from the Bible 
And I, being raised Catholic, I think it's fair for me to talk about this. To be a, a Catholic, if you were ever going to be canonized as a saint or declared a saint, they have a set of rules that you have to meet all these specific requirements and you have to have done a miracle, you have to have lived this exemplary life, you had to, all kinds of things. And so when people today hear the word saint, that's the first thing they think of, is somebody that's lived this really extraordinary monostatic life, you know, been really religious and stuff. And that's not the definition of a saint in the Bible. A saint in the Bible is, as it says here, let's read it so I make sure I say it pretty good. A person who is set apart by God and is sacred to him. It's got nothing to do with behavior. Although behavior becomes an outworking of being a saint. Behavior, your behavior will be impacted by the fact that you are a saint. And so during the dispensation of the grace of God, a saint is one who has believed that Jesus Christ died for his sins and is trusting him as his savior. A saint is saved by grace through faith alone. A saint believes what God has illumined to his mind. And here comes the little addition. Along with that, saints believe a lot of other things that may or may not be true. And so there are many saints today that believe in the fact that Paul was chosen by Christ to take a message, a mystery, a secret message, to the Gentiles. You know, that's a very small part of the church, the body of Christ today. That's a very small percentage of the saints today. And so to show you how uh, amazing it is, I think I'll jump ahead here. I guess I didn't even put it on there. Oh yeah, here it is. I skipped it. Uh, not only are those terms man created, but here's a whole bunch of other terms and things that are by man. Uh, So-called Christians, amongst Christians, there are sects and denominations and all kinds of identifications such as Calvinism, Arminianism, Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, all kinds of denominations. And then there's also nearly 33,089 Christian denominations in the world. That's mind-boggling to me. But they're all professed Christians. And that may include Mormonism and Jehovah Witnesses. I don't know what all it includes, what they included in it. But then going on, there are nearly 4,000 recognized faiths outside of Christianity. Christianity is just one of those faiths. And so around the globe, there's all kinds of different faiths. And almost 75% of the world population follow one of the five main faiths, which include Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And so there's just a bundle of stuff out there under the term of religion, and they are theists. They believe in God. There are other religions that don't really believe in God as an individual or a person. It, it, it's just overwhelming when you spend your time. My mind gets into this, and I start doing some research, and I get caught up in it. And it gets overwhelming with all of the different sects and denominations and ignorance that is concluded from all of that information. But the word saint or saints is used a hundred times in the scriptures. And so from now on, you can call me Saint Mark. 
And it won't be because I did any miracle or it won't be because I did any great works or anything. And you don't, please don't call me St. Mark. But I know I'm a saint. So in all of this, a saint believes what God has illumined to his mind. And so what I'm going to share with you comes from my studies and what I believe. But every individual saint is not responsible ultimately to anyone but God himself who separated him, who made him, who made you a saint. And so to answer these questions, so does God really exist? Well, the atheists would say, what God? Or the atheist would say, no. An agnostic says, I don't know. And a theist says, yes. Can human beings find him? An atheist says, there's nothing to find. You're wasting your time if you believe all that stuff. An agnostic says, find who? He doesn't have any idea. The theist has a broad range of answers, depending upon what little twist and turn or tweak they've done. In fact, uh, this could be dangerous, but I'm going to do it. We have some very good friends that are Baha'i. You know what that is? They take all those main faiths, they take almost any faith, and cherry pick all the good things out of it. Now they believe in God, they believe there's one God, but it has, he is the light, and there are many lanterns. He's used different people, throughout time, different men to shine light for us as human beings. And they are the most wonderful people you would ever want to meet. You couldn't ask for better neighbors because they live totally on this concept of doing good for mankind, taking care of the planet that God has given us, all of those things. And so they're wonderful people. And so I hope no one here was raised like I was, where if you weren't my religion, you weren't anything. If you didn't believe the way I believed, it didn't matter. We were the only ones that were going to get there. That was the way I grew up. Now, they, they might not have expressed it that way, but that's the way I took it. So the final one, can human beings know God? An atheist says, there's no one to know. An agnostic says, again, know who. And again, theists have many answers. And so I would like to share with you this morning, and it's no surprise, I don't think, but I believe I am a saint. I believe there is a God. I believe that he sent his son into the world, and he died in my place. He died for my sin, and I've trusted him and him alone as my savior and I believe that I will be with him forever and I believe that my faith then should come from where God has made known his declarations through the scriptures and so my responses to these questions does God exist yes I believe God exists I know he exists by faith. I believe he created all things that are created. It's hard, and that's going to be our first study, Lord willing, next week is about where's God been if he's existed from everlasting to everlasting? What's he been doing? And that's sort of mind boggling to the human mind. But I, in, in, uh, Genesis 1.1, the very beginning of the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's all I need to know today is the Bible says it, and I believe it. Colossians 1.15-17, through 17, the Apostle Paul tells us, as members of the church, the body of Christ, He, God, or the Lord Jesus Christ in this case, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven 
and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I think that's so critical that we understand that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, created all things and they're all existing for him. Human beings have the tendency to think that this world exists for us. It exists for Christ and his purpose and his glory. And then Hebrews eleven six, And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And that verse will need some explanation that we'll get to later. Can human beings find them? Now here comes one that is a little bit uh, shocking, I guess. I can't think of the word I, I really want to use. But my answer is, can human beings find him? No. They can. I believe human beings have the innate potential. They have the ability, the knowledge, the head knowledge, the brain ability. They have the ability to find God, but they have no desire whatsoever to do it on God's terms. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. In Galatians 6, 5, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And then a little later in verse, chapter 8 and verse 2 of Genesis, imagination of man's heart is evil from youth. Romans 3, 10 and 11 as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. And then 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so, the final question, can human beings know him? Even though they can't seek him, they can know him. How's that possible? Only by divine revelation. Only by God revealing himself. We we're told that God is invisible, so no one has seen God. We can't see the invisible. In 1 Samuel 3, 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. He was already serving in the temple, but he didn't know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. He was working in the temple. And he still didn't know the God of Israel. And then verse 21, the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. If you'll remember uh, Job when the Lord told him in the last chapters of the book of Job, the Lord told him, get ready, prepare yourself like a man because I'm going to talk to you now. And he spends two chapters talking to Job. And when he got done talking to Job, Job said, I had heard about you before, but now I see you. God had revealed himself to Job, and Job knew him. He saw him in his faith's eye. In Matthew 16, verses 15 through 17. But what about you, 
the Lord's talking to Peter. And he asked him, who do people say I am? And he said, Isaiah. And he went through three or four. And then Christ says, but who do you say I am? And he says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Those who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and have trusted Christ, believing he died for their sins, know him. The Spirit of God has revealed them to them, and they have believed in Christ. I know him, and I trust Christ. All of you know him. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 9 through 14. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us, to the saints, by his spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except man's spirit within him? And those, these verses are so critical to understand how we come to know God. Man can't do it. All he can identify with other men, with other human beings. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. And why did that happen? That we might understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in the words taught us by human wisdom, but in the words taught by the Spirit expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. <coughs> now again, with my limited Greek knowledge, and I don't profess to be an academic in any way, but I don't believe that's a very accurate translation of what was being expressed in the Greek. The King James Version says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. And most commentators, here's where these differences come in, you know, I mentioned many believe different things. I don't believe that that's referring to the unsaved man, even though that's true. The natural man, the word natural there is suke. I'm in trouble. I don't know how to spell it right now, but it's something like that. And it has to do with the mind. It's not, it's not spiritual, which is pneuma. It's not carnal, which is sarks. It's suke that deals with the mind or the soul. And it's saying here that the man that cannot find God by his own thinking, or if he's trusting in his own abilities, he won't find God that way. He won't understand God's truth. If it were just knowledge, it would be enough. I've shared this many times. When I was in Bible college, we had a uh, we went to hear a Jewish rabbi who had his doctorate in New Testament theology. He knew the New Testament inside out. He knew all that it said. But he expressed, I don't believe Jesus Christ ever existed. And if he did, his mentor failed him. In the Jewish religion, young men had mentors that, that were responsible, sort of like their tutors, to bring them up in the truth of their religion. 
And so if Jesus Christ existed and went on to do what the Bible says he did, this man believed that his mentor had failed him. And so knowledge, human wisdom, the world's wisdom, all those things are foolishness with God. But we as saints have the mind of Christ. We can know these things. And so I don't think this phrase in either case is referring to just the unsaved. There are many, many people who do not, who are saved individuals, I believe, who do not see the truth of the mystery. And they're not our enemies or anything like that. If you have seen the truth of the, ministry, of the mystery, you've been greatly blessed by the revelation that God has given you. And he's given it to you for a purpose, for his glory. And that should be our heart's desire is to, Lord, you've shown me these things. Use them in me for your glory. You reveal them to me. You save me. You reveal these truths to me. Use me for your glory. I give myself to you to that end. In Ephesians 3, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul says this. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. How did Paul get his revelation? He made it very plain that he didn't receive it by man, neither was he taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he goes on here to say, you might understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed. As you read through Paul's messages or epistles over and over again, you'll find that the emphasis is on the fact that God has made it known. God has revealed it. Man didn't discover it. Man didn't figure it out. When I first became a believer, <coughs> I thought the more time I spent studying and the more time I spent trying to figure out all of this stuff, the better Christian I would be. Well, the motivation of study was good, but the concept I had that it would depend upon me to understand it and it doesn't happen that way to truly understand spiritual truth it is spiritually discerned now I'm not suggesting we shouldn't study we shouldn't be diligent to do all we can do to know God better <coughs> but only God can reveal himself only God can teach us the truth and so in Ephesians he says uh, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. And then Paul here in Ephesians 1.9, I think is talking about himself and those who were with him. And he may also have been talking about those that had uh, embraced his teaching. But he says in Ephesians 1.9, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. And then in Colossians 1, 25 through 27, Paul writes, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me. <coughs> Paul didn't volunteer for duty. God called him and empowered him to respond to do and he was given a ministry a course to follow and Paul says that when he was told he was facing all kinds of difficult things ahead he says none of these things deter me that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry I've received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God and so Paul was given this commission by God and he goes on to say to present to you the word of God in its fullness or in its completeness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known 
to the saints God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles. And that's part of the secret that the Gentiles would be given this glorious revelation, the riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Remember when Christ walked on this earth and the Gentile woman came to him and the disciples saying, send her away, she troubleth us, and she's pleading with him or calling after him, and he won't answer her. And finally he answers her, and what does he say? He says, I'm sent only to the lost house of the nation of Israel. I'm sent only to the lost sheep of the nation of Israel. And he says it's not fit to give the children's food to the dogs. And now we have this new revelation that was given to Paul that was never known, that now Gentiles are going to have the privilege of Christ dwelling in them. That's part of the glorious gospel of the grace of God. And then Ephesians 1.17, and this is uh, sort of my motivation for the coming messages. I keep asking, and Paul is saying a prayer here, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you, we could say, that he might give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know him better. And so that's why I covet your prayers in the coming weeks, so that I might be able to present to you the truth of the word of God about the God that we worship. Because there is so much misunderstanding. That's why there are how many? 33,089 different denominations of Christianity? Why there are 4,000 different faiths? Because they don't know the unknown God. But he has revealed himself to us. Now by us I mean the saints. Not just those that know the mystery. But all those who by the power of Christ's death and the resurrection of Christ have now been indwelt with him through his spirit that we might know the things that God has for us. And so, again, pray for me in preparation for these coming messages. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to know you. Nothing we deserve, nothing you're under obligation to do in any sense, and yet in your divine purpose, you've chosen us to be with you forever. To be members of the church, the body of Christ. To be redeemed by grace through faith alone. And to have the assurance of eternal life with you forever. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, and we entreat you now to teach each one of us, reveal yourself to us individually through your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.